Wait, hold on. We're not rolling. <laughs> Welcome to the Now Lately. It is my distinct honor and privilege, and in, and in fact, I'm awed to have as my guest today, the great Noah Mickens. A pleasure. Thank you for coming aboard. Thank you, Leo. Now, the thing about Noah is that uh, I was doing some research on Noah, going through the going through the the, the internet and um, going through my notes from our previous conversation, and basically I just gave up because there's just too much stuff. It's just just too much stuff. Isn't it great? And I would need a teleprompter, <laughs> but I have an idea. I wanted to I wanted to sort of list uh, a lot of the major projects that you've been involved in, and since I don't have a teleprompter, I think what I'll do is I will just kind of uh, just move my mouth, and then we can dub it in later. All right. So, um, so I think uh, most recently, or currently, we're talking about Wanderlust, uh, Wanderlust Circus. Wanderlust Circus is my, is my current uh, uh, all-consuming passion and al almost the only project that I still do. Yeah, I've okay. kind of included, everything is now a part of Wanderlust Circus. Right, okay. But before Wanderlust Circus, there was Bogville with Tiar Tashne, Societas Insomnia, The Girls Performative Art, 36 Invisible, The International Radon Collective, Nequaquam Vacuum, Panbuto, Soraya, The 999 Eyes of Endless Dream Carnival, and Slideshow of the Damned, The Sunday Lounge, Rotur, Bronx, Batis Hippodrome and the Hippodrome Circus Art Center. And before that, there was, um... Am I forgetting anything? Uh, well, that might be about it. Yeah? I mean, um, uh, that, that I've been allowed to produce anyway. I mean, that you've been I, allowed I think to that's, produce. That's almost all of it. I, I don't recall. Did you did you mention um, uh, the uh, oh like um, <laughs> No, that's a good point. That was long ago. That, that was long ago. I barely. Yeah. There's there's very little record, and in, in fact, I mean, it's never even been proven that any of that necessarily happened. It's right. alleged. Right. It's an allegedly right. something I used to do. Well, there there was, and then there was the mention of the uh, of of the, I don't even know if I should mention this, but I will. Is that, do we, can we even, no, no, please do we need to cut that out? That's, that's, that's through the road not taken for okay, me, really. Okay, we sort of, it's, it's, it's who I did, who I turned out not to be. Right, okay. Sort of just not address that. Okay. In this forum. You've had the definition of an illustrious life, <laughs> I think. Well, I don't, I mean, I spend, maybe it depends on a few things. I, there, there's some impressive stuff that I've done over the years, but certainly not illustrious in terms of, um, you know, like I, I never really made any money doing it and haven't really achieved any widespread fame or renown. It's all very, very localized and pretty limited. But in terms of my life in Portland, I count it as an absolute success. Yeah, yeah. And your life in Portland began in... 1996. Uh, 96. is when I moved here when I was 22 years old. Yeah. If you don't mind, though, I'd like to ask a bit about your your childhood because uh, you were reading all kinds of things. You were surrounded by books and plays and theater. And it's true. Um, my, my mother was an actress when she was young uh, in Kansas City, Missouri, mm. which, I mean, it's not, a, not, not perhaps not as much of a, of a punchline as it sounds like. Because Kansas City is actually a rather large cosmopolitan city with tall buildings and, you know, public transportation and stuff. I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a real city. Yeah. And uh, she grew up there in the... 50s and 60s, and then as she became sort of a young adult, she was acting quite a bit, and then moved to Los Angeles with her boyfriend, I think, to pursue an acting career. Uh, well, then had me, long story short, and didn't have one after all. Mm. So that was uh, some of my earliest recollection is all my mom's old books. She had uh, a ton of Shakespeare, and she had Greek tragedies and stuff. And she had the three that that three volume set of all of Brecht's writing. Uh -huh. that I read when I was very young. Uh -huh. She had a lot of Ionesco, especially I remember reading Rhinoceros when yeah. I was super young and being yeah. real into it. Yeah, I, I have I have a Rhinoceros story. I remember yeah yeah when I was um, I don't know I must have been in fourth grade maybe, mm -hmm. and uh, one night Rhinoceros was on TV and my parents were watching. There's a but movie. The what is a rhinoceros? Carl is a rhinoceros. You're talking gibberish. Nicholson became a rhinoceros. The press just made it up. They do these sort of things. They just, just they sell papers. No! I was chased all the way here by a rhinoceros. Hmm. 
parents, my parents are watching this thing, and I was, it was way past my bedtime, but I heard the whole thing, and I desperately wanted to see, to see this. Just the audio of Rhinoceros. Just the audio of the movie version of Rhinoceros. <laughs> and, um, it's, got the, it's got the happy ending. It's got, <laughs> right. <laughs> and, then, and then everyone's not a rhinoceros, and right. they fall in love, and right. they marry it. It's, it's all very yeah. good. <laughs> and I was so upset about missing it that the next day, when I came back from school, I made up the story that all my friends in school were talking about the UNESCO's rhinoceros because they, they had all been able to watch it the night before. <laughs> God, I wanted my parents to feel guilty for not letting me watch rhinoceros. Did, did they buy it? Did they go for it? They did. They believed it. They felt kind of bad. <laughs> but anyway, anyway, um, just speaking of people who have had rhinoceros experiences early on and are now drinking whiskey out of a, a, a pink elephant. You mean you see it too? I think I was reading all that when I was, yeah, like, like four or five, six years yeah. old. I was reading all that stuff. So, uh, And my mother had all kinds of uh, musical, Broadway musical records, like record albums that we yeah. listened to a lot. And See, I was very early on exposed to a ton of classical theater as well as kind of more first half of the 20th century sort of experimental theater right. as well okay. as um, uh, more... Um, uh, schmaltzy uh, 1960s musical theater stuff, a lot of West Side Story and all that. So yeah, I think and, all and those things are formative parts of how I am these days. All right, all right. Um, did you have a preference for um, uh, for for any? I mean, you know, the, the, the sort of early 20th century avant garde. Actually, hold that thought. Yes. While we um, do this. <laughs> Impressive. Um, I just I, the lighting has suddenly changed, or is it me? Or uh, do you do you still see this thing? Um, I can see it. Yes, okay. yes. Right. My, my, my my vision is good. Perhaps not twenty twenty, but strong vision nevertheless. Strong. I think the lighting is better. I think the lighting feels a little bit more uh, a little more casual. Yeah. Like we're just sort of hanging around. We are. Yeah. In your bachelor pad. Right. I mean, because this is how I hang out with people. Mm -hmm. I just kind of face, you know, face more or less mm -hmm. this area with them. It's kind of. It's also how I have when I have dinner parties. Mm -hmm. I make sure to leave one side of the table, you know, empty of chairs. So right, you know, right. people at the ends and the other, around there. Mm -hmm. I'm the same way. It's actually what's broken up most of my relationships. You know, cheating. Ah. Oh. If there's anybody out there who's in theater, you're they're dying. They're they're rolling on the floor right now. They are. They're very, rolling very on the floor, very right. demonstrably. I imagine they're probably laughing in like a really they really are just have, yeah big flamboyant way. Send us in your your oh. your vines of you rolling on the floor after that, please, theater people. <laughs> talking about. Oh, I was asking you about, uh, you, you, you talked about all these different kinds of theatrical influences when you were, when you were a kid, and ranging from, uh, from early 20th century avant-garde mm -hmm. to, uh, to, to Broadway musicals to schmaltzy 60s kind of stuff. And I wondered, I mean, I, I imagine that the answer is that you're omnivorous and you were a sponge, but did you have preferences? I did. Uh, when I was a kid, when I was really young, I was really, really into Shakespeare and really into the characters and talking about it and learning about it and trying to see the movies and stuff uh, much more so than into the into the Greek uh, classical theater uh -huh. or, or uh, Ionesco uh, I, I read when I was very young and I, I think um, found to be sort of frightening and strange but also really compelling and I had sort of a yeah I had a, I had a, a, a difficult relationship with the with yeah. the absurdist playwrights that yeah. I read that Eventually, I think grew into a more of a comfortable uh, enjoyment of their work. But yeah. you know, when I was a kid, I think it, I was kind of frightened by it. There was, besides Ryan, Rhinoceros, there was like a Jack the Submission and the Lesson and something else. The Future is in Eggs mm -hmm. were all um, 
were all in the same book. And I remember finding that book frightening. It had photographs uh-huh. of the of of a production of, of it. Yeah. yeah, that I think was... Might have been film stills from the movie I saw. Maybe so. No, no, it was, it was like stage stuff. Okay. Um, at any rate, I, I, I think that it was... Yeah, Shakespeare was a favorite. Well, and the musicals. I, I always have been and still am really into Broadway musicals. Yeah. And that's something my mom was super into and me. We would, you know, back then when they had went on television instead of infomercials, they would have old movies yeah. all the time. Yeah. And so I got right. to see just the sure. whole, all the crazy old Broadway stuff um, and, and Golden Age, MGM stuff and all yeah. that and yeah. all that. When I was a, a tiny little child, it was a very huge influence on me. I was super into like Jesus Christ Superstar and West Side Story and Cabaret okay. a lot. Yeah. Whenever, whenever they would come on TV, we'd make popcorn. And, yeah, yeah. yeah. I can see the cabaret, of course, but... So, I mean, it was curtains for me. There was no way I was ever going to not grow up to be in theater. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Um, and the Shakespeare... Now, you ended up... We'll just jump around here a little bit, but you ended up at Ashland, right? At, at one point? It, That's correct. Doing, doing Shakespeare? It's the first... Well, I wasn't performing. No, I was, performing. Just, okay. I was in, like, a like a, a semester abroad program. Okay. When I uh, was briefly going to college. During my very, very, very brief and not particularly successful flirtation with a college education, yeah. I... I, I uh, came to Ashland for the Shakespeare Festival and stayed for the summer and got to meet a bunch of the actors and do things like this, which was uh, a very unfamiliar experience. Really the first time that I had been, um, I was the, the youngest person there too, so it was the first time I had been around a bunch of older folks on their own in a strange new city. Mm-hmm. And I loved it, I was really impressed. I'm, I'm from Los Angeles, uh, and you know, Los Angeles in the 1980s was such a dirty, filthy place yeah. that I, I was really accustomed to smog and dirty water and garbage everywhere and I showed up in Ashland and it's just like this paradise. I was in the shower and got some of the water in my mouth and felt guilty because I could tell how clean and good it was. <laughs> like it tasted <laughs> like you would have to pay for it to have be delivered to your door by the gallon. Yeah. And you know, here you are washing your body. Like literally like spraying it all yeah. over myself. Yeah. yeah. It's just spinning down the drain and right. It, it, it's a very it's a very different for me. It was a lot of adjustment to make. Um, and it took me for several more years before I actually moved here. But when I finally moved here with my entire social scene, like me and all of my friends moved here at the same yeah, time. Yeah. And w- when we finally did that, uh, Ashland was really the only point of reference that I had. Mm. It was kind of my, the closest thing to a good reason I had for leaving my entire life behind and moving to Portland. So really, so you're in L.A., you and your circle of friends, and you decide to leave, leave L.A. to go somewhere where the shower or water is potable. <laughs> and, and Portland... Basically, you're you're magnetized to Portland because of your Ashland experience. That was really uh, kind of it, or you know, I mean, that was it. Uh, but clearly, that doesn't make a whole lot of sense. And I, I've talked to so many people that have had this sort of experience of winding up here, not because of a big master plan yeah. or a good reason yeah. of, of any kind, but yeah. just sort of like for some strange reason trying it out. Yeah. And then ending up staying here. I, I, I've got friends who've been living here for ten years, and they're just here because their car broke down or something. Mm-hmm, you know, mm-hmm, right. so it's, it's got a way of uh, it's got a way of getting its hooks in you. It's a special, strange, beautiful place. It is. It is. It'd be very hard for me to imagine moving someplace else at this point because I'm just so connected to the city. Yeah, well, I agree. I, I wouldn't want to live anywhere else. Could we get a sponsorship from the Portland uh, Chamber of Commerce or something like that? Could Portland- Several years ago, it was one of the best kept secrets in the convention and tourism industry. Well, no more. It seems like meeting planners, association executives, and visitors are discovering Northwest cities as their preferred destination. As you can see, we want you to get on board. Your next stop is Portland, Oregon. Keep Portland weird. What's the, what's the, is there, that's not the official slogan of the series, right? <laughs> it's not like, it the, the Chamber of one. Commerce one probably, they probably have bumper stickers that say keep Portland profitable or something and they think that's funny. They, I, they think that's funny. That right now they're rolling on the ground laughing. Mm-hmm. I don't, I want to see that. I want to see footage of that. <laughs> I'll tell you something right now. Portland's never going to be profitable. No. There's no, there's no, the amount of change that would have to take place is right. that it, it's not going to happen. Right. People are, people worry about this, right? I got this friend, um, I'm not going to name her because I, I, I might end up saying something embarrassing about her, but, but she, she is obsessed with the idea that Portland as a city is like in trouble and it's heading toward, but it's going to be super modernized. It's going to be the next Seattle and the next right. San Francisco and the next Manhattan the next or whatever. Dubai. That's not going to happen. No. 
it's not this has never happened no. here. There's not enough basically money. Right. And that's that's what's all there is to it. Right. Portland's gonna always be a freaky, weird, dirty place because there's just no money here. And it's here, here. Yeah, it can't right. <laughs> and, I, and I'll be there. <laughs> In the muck. In the film. In the muck. Making a circus show. Or whatever it is up here.